Hey guys, you know, I've been asking about the community group and what we need to do and what people are looking for and what is it they want to see happen and want to experience in the community and how can I help? Uh, the reason why I'm asking is because I'm a big believer that the kingdom of God changes not just a person, but a community and changes even the world around them. I believe that because I've seen it happen and I've, I've I've rubbed shoulders with men who have done it, men and women who have done it, who have gone into communities and transformed entire communities in different parts of the world, okay? And I know this could happen because I've experienced it in my whole life. <clears throat> so I was trying to find out from people what happened. You know, I've got different information. You know, people want to see uh, how the spiritual can be demonstrated in the physical. For example... If you're a kingdom citizen, is your life reflecting heaven? If you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, is your life reflecting heaven? Because you see, Jesus said, go into all the world and teach good news. Right? Teach this good news. Baptizing them. Um... The, the challenge we have is that when we read Jesus' words, we are reading English. Jesus didn't speak English. Secondly, our minds hear something else other than what he is trying to convey. I was told a long time that um, you know, one of my teachers, um, Dr. Miles, he said his, 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 in, in his communication class, his teacher was trying to explain to them that Meanings are in people, not in words. What it means is that we could use the same words, but what we mean could be something different because of our own perspective. <laughs> so even though I'm using a word that's supposed to have a definition in an English in a dictionary, what we actually mean by it could be different. Both of us communicating, but we, our communication are misunderstand, mis, misunderstood by each other because the, the reasoning or the, the understanding or the expectation behind the word is different. <laughs> That's a, it's a big thing. Communication is real hard. I mean, it's like, I got, I got, a, I got a three in English. So, I, um, you could blame me if you don't understand me. I got a three in English, right? Twice. So, <laughs> okay. Twice or three times. I can't remember. Okay. But I had to learn to communicate. I had to learn it with, with, with youths. I'm surprised that actually I'm able to influence youths. I'm surprised. That's God. That, that's totally God. Because I know by my own self, I can't do this. So, but anyway, Jesus is saying some things and then we are reading it. The challenge is we are interpreting it based upon what we think. And I, I spoke before, sometime ago, about the, the, these five challenges that we go through in trying to apply the kingdom of God in our physical reality. Five challenges. One challenge is there's a, there's a challenge between the spiritual and the physical. <clears throat> we think that the physical that we see with our eyes is real. And Jesus thinks that the spiritual, which we don't see with our eyes, is real. That's a big challenge. That's a big issue. So we are thinking this is real. He's thinking that is real. What? <laughs> so we are excited when we see physical results. Like when we stop sniffling because the flu has gone. Or we stop feeling a pain in the physical body. Or somebody give us a physical gift. Or somebody give us a news that we hear that we won something or we got a, a bill paid off or we got a raise. or we, we are excited about the physical things. Jesus is excited about spiritual things that he knows has happened. As a matter of fact, he, he said it like this to the disciples. Don't rejoice because the demons run from you or afraid of you because you see something physically happen. Rejoice because, hey, there is something spiritually that has happened already, even before that. The spiritual thing is that your name, your registration name is in heaven, is in the books of heaven. It's like, it's like saying, 
um, you have now become a citizen of a country that is so prosperous and abundant, they will do anything for you. That is like citizenship. Really? I'm a citizen, so I could get anything I want from this country? Yeah. So that is a rejoice. So now they can see that. It wasn't something that they could see physically. Um, it wasn't something that um, somebody, a voice from heaven, told them somewhere. So they say, hey, you do you know I heard the voice that says, my no. But Jesus is telling rejoice about this thing that they can't see, smell, taste, touch, or hear. Which five senses? Hmm. What? That's spiritual. This is physical. That's a big challenge. It's the biggest challenge we have. Uh, I mean, there are, there, there, there are four others, right? There is language versus idea, uh, which is, means that we are reading, we are reading languages when we, read, when we read the Bible, whether it's English, Spanish, French, Dutch, whatever language we belong to. And we, we, are, we rejoice in the language without getting the idea behind it. What does he mean? And that is more important than what we read. What we read may not necessarily be what he's trying to convey. I remember a long time when we were doing, when I was doing um, hermeneutics, which is the study of interpretations, how to interpret, it, interpret um, foreign language or ancient language, ex interpret the Bible and so forth. I did this thing called hermeneutics. And hermeneutics require, the aim of, of hermeneutics or interpretation is not to interpret the words that are written, but to discover the author's intention <laughs> that's the aim the aim is not just to be able to translate what was written but what did the author intend for me to know or believe or do or think that is the aim of it so who is the author of the word of god of the bible is it john who wrote is it matthew who wrote is it elijah who wrote or is it you know moses who wrote who is, the, who is the author? Are these people the authors? No. The author is God. They are just the writers. So the author have an have a intention, have an idea in his mind that he wants to convey. And he gave it to people to write. Just like the, the people who used to write the law um, in those days were called scribes. They were writers. In the, king, the kings had scribes. Um, the people in the, the, the religious leaders in Jesus, they had scribes. They were write. They were scribes. So all the men who wrote, they were like scribes to God. They wrote what God wanted to convey to us. They wrote the material in the language they spoke. But then we now have to interpret that. But more than that, we have to understand what is his intention in, in being the author of this passage, this verse, this word that he used. Why did he use, tell the person to use that word? What is his intention? That is more important than the language we read. So there's this challenge between language and idea, right? That we have to struggle with and try to figure out. Another one is time versus eternity. So we celebrate times, days, seasons, for example, birthdays, anniversaries, you know? Uh, they even have work anniversary now <laughs> that people celebrate. Big thing, right? I mean, I mean, I hear, I hear, um, um, not just not just married couples celebrating anniversaries. I hear engaged couples or boyfriends and girlfriends celebrating anniversaries now. It's like, what is going on here, right? Times. But we don't celebrate what, what is our life in connection with our eternal purpose or eternal reason for being here. So eternity, and, and, and God says that in, in Ecclesiastes, God has put eternity in our hearts, but man has not realized it. Wow, he has put eternity in us, but it's something that is hidden. You know, Proverbs, um, 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 Solomon wrote in, in Proverbs, and God caused Solomon to write, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, to hide something, but it's the glory of kings to discover, to receive it, to get it to unearth, to reveal, to get out something, right? It means that, it doesn't mean just kings, but men. When you, when you discover something, you become like a king. It's like, wow, you discover something that God hide. He didn't hide it so that you couldn't find it. He hide it because he want you to make effort to find it, to discover it. 
the challenge is the work that is needed to fulfill that eternal thing, that thing that, that came from eternity, that, that purpose, that reason for being here, that is eternal, that is not just temporary, that doesn't fit, just fit into time. That is more important than the celebration of time or the celebration of days and anniversaries. So the question is, have you discovered your purpose? And when did you discover it? Do you have an anniversary for your, the, way, the time you discovered your purpose? You know? Do you have an anniversary for that? Do you have a celebration for that? Did you celebrate when you discovered it? We don't, right? <laughs> because it's not valuable to us. It's not a value thing. But to God, it's value. To God, that's more valuable than the days. Than the days and the years and whatever. Yeah. That is more valuable. The reason for your marriage, for your family. Is that being celebrated? When you discover that, is that more important? As a matter of fact, people feel that God is excited because they're living good in a divorce situation or separation situation. Because they're living in right standing, but they're divorced. Um, and sometimes we don't know where the problem is. But that's a message for another time. Anyway. That's the, the theory. There's an, um, so I mentioned spiritual versus physical, time versus eternity, um, language versus idea. All right? That's three. Here's another one. Sonship versus slavery. Right? That's what is kind of obvious. Right? That's kind of obvious, but it's a struggle. Because we grew up as sons or children of our earthly parents, that has become more valuable than son of God. When last did you look in the mirror and say, here was happening? Good morning, son of God. Or did you tell somebody, you know I'm a son of God? Do you know that I'm a son of God? The one who created all those things that you're seeing there? Those, those clouds, the weather, the stars. The... Do you know I'm, a, I'm his son? When last did you say that? Did you share that with somebody? Are you a son of God? You know, when last do you feel excited by be, or for being a son of God? Regardless of what the physical conditions are, physical situations around you are. When last did you convey the excitement of being a son of God? Hmm. Wow. And did you give thanks for that? I'm not just saying, thank you, Lord, for being a son. I'm not talking about this religious thing. I'm talking about deep down inside, you feel as if somebody just gave you a billion dollar business and make you an heir to it and say, um, you know, I've been looking for you so long and so long. I wanted because you have did, did this thing for me so many years. I wanted to make you an heir to this, this my, my company, you know, so when I die, it's yours and, and you can receive anything you want. Even now, you just go and you you could put um, the checks or anything in my name and the name of the company, name, and the company, company buying anything for you. Because right now, you, you are part owner of the company. It's a billion dollar company. You feel that way as if, yeah. This is life, a son of God. Well, that's, that's how you feel when you, when you understand what it means to be a son of God. And that, the hurdle to get over the slavery of living as sons of our parents who maybe didn't give us the kind of heritage and the kind of wealth and, and health and power and authority that we see other people seem to have, seem to have, right? You say they have it, they seem to have. We feel as if we are slaves, as if we are slaves to the systems, slaves to money, slaves to the bills, slaves to the weather, slaves to viruses, slaves to bacteria, right? <laughs> slaves to the food we eat, slaves to the heat, slaves to traffic. I mean, we feel as if everything has us ooh, stress, depress, oppress, slave to this old car. Ooh, what's going on? We feel as slaves. So we need to come over that hurt to reality. Regardless of what's happened, that's okay. I'm a son of God. So you need to come to that point, right? Um, one of my, my coaches he, um, that I'm listening to, he said, somebody told him, he said, he said, Myron, I, would have, I wouldn't feel so, so stressed if I had your money. And he told him, he said, hey, what happened? He said, I only got this money because, he, what he said? He, I only got this money because I got out of distress. That was the only reason why. Um, where did I put this? One moment. You know? Yeah, that's something so, so, so real. 
He had to tell him, he said, I only got out of this because I first had to get out of the stress of it. Mentally. Right? Before I could become. Before I could receive this. The mentality was needed before he could have received it. Now, the link between the physical and the spiritual is the mentality. Developing a mentality of being who we are, believing that we are this person, doing it, doing the life and the activities as this person causes us to have the things that this person will have. In other words, believing that we are like Jesus, that we are sons of God, just like Jesus said, I'm a son of man, I'm also a, I'm a son of God. We now have to be saying and believing and knowing, wait a minute, I am a son of God, like Jesus is a son of God. I am a son of God too. Not just Jesus alone is the son of God. I am also the son of God. What is this? Being that and then doing son of God activities causes me to receive what Jesus received. Authority, power, results, multiplication, whatever it is. From slavery to sonship. That's a big hurdle. But the mentality of developing it is training, teaching, influencing yourself, persuading yourself, um, transforming. But, you, 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 but because we have the Spirit of God, He does it in us. So we don't have to do it ourselves. We could actually have the Holy Spirit doing the work for us and show us. Right? So sonship versus slavery. Um, fifth one is religion versus rulership. The big hurdle with religion is that it has been so ingrained in us that we could actually, we could be practicing religious um, culture, culture of religious lifestyle instead of a rulership lifestyle without even knowing it because it's so ingrained in us. The way we interact with each other. I'm not talking about praying and and, and doing um, the, the rituals. I'm talking about the lifestyle of a religious person. Lifestyle could be blaming other people, complaining, thinking that we are better than somebody else, all kind of stuff. Um, um, boasting about ourselves, um, uh, trying to protect ourselves from people, all kind of stuff. That's religion. When you're, when you're in the king, when you're in the kingdom, you don't need to protect yourself from nobody. You can walk down the road. I remember to walking down the road. I remember uh, a few weeks ago, I had to go and meet my family in Naparima Bowl. So I had to work, walk from High Street to Naparima Bowl. And it was like, what time that was? It was like after 7 in the night. And much, not much, you're going down, down High Street and at the bottom, and you had to go up, go up that street that goes to the hospital and then go down to Naparima Bowl. And... Nobody on the road. I saw some dogs. I think I saw one vagrant or something, like one or two vagrants or whatever. And I'm walking there alone, you know? And I'm hearing my imagination trying to say, but well, you walk in this place alone, somebody's so, supposed someone's so. And, so. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm hearing myself, or oh, the Spirit of God saying, you, know, you forget he has a seal on him, he's a son. <laughs> and I walk in there comfortable, and I'm looking back, and not afraid of nothing comfortable because I know I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a son one and I'm in a kingdom and 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 my army works with, works with me as a son of God so in a kingdom I could walk anywhere I'm not going to commit some crime I'm not going out of the will of my father I'm in the will of my father I'm going to meet my family they were at a play there and so forth and I had to go and meet them and thing and they had the car and I dropped off in, um, had a, a shuttle from my job to San Fernando where they dropped me. Um, but they couldn't drop me to the place. They have, they have their, their spot, they have to drop everybody. And then we have to walk and go wherever we have to go. No problem. I'm in God's will. I'm in my father's will. So he has to take care of me in his will. Right? And anything that comes to me, first, he has to approve it. <laughs> Anybody that has to confront me, with any kind of evil thinking or intention, he has to first approve it. And once they reach me and they confront me, my first thought is, okay, daddy, you approve this. So what to do here? He approved this to happen for the person to confront me and I need to know what needs to be done. I don't need to think about what needs to be done. I will have the words as, as, the, as, as my father said in his word. 
I will have the right words to say at the time that somebody bring me to the judge or whatever it is. That same principle applies to when I'm in a situation I don't know what to do. The spirit who is in me will tell me what to do, what to say, how to respond at that time. Wow, that's a kingdom. He, he just provides. He just delivers. He's just, he just there. So people could confront. A criminal could have come. What well, could have come? That could have happened, but here was happening. Before it comes, my father had to approve it. <laughs> that's what I love. I love this. Do you know that our father had to approve the test for Job before the enemy could have touched Job and his belongings and what he had? The father, our father had to approve of it first. Wow. You can imagine that, that everything that comes to you, our father approves it and say, yes, I approve this test. No, you can't do that test. That, that one, no, not that one, but you could, appro you, I'm approving this one. <laughs> wow. He, he disapproved things that the enemy can bring to us and he approves what the enemy can bring to us. So you think we're going to say that? Yeah, this other thing. Uh, they're just under my father's guidance. That's all. My father's approval. <laughs> That's the thinking of a kingdom. Of a kingdom citizen. Being in a kingdom is awesome because in a kingdom, the king takes care of his citizens. And because we brought up into religion, and most religions were, were, were developed under, um, yes, some kingdoms, but in our days, a lot of it is developed under democracy, government. We know that in democracies, the leaders in democracies are not personally concerned about us. Specifically, in other words, the, the president or prime minister or leader of your country doesn't feel worried because you're going to bed hungry or worried that your car break down or that your children misbehave or your husband misbehaving or your wife not listening, whatever it is. He doesn't feel directly, personally harassed or stressed about that. But in our kingdom, Man, the king is personally affected by everything that happens to his, his citizens. Everything. Not his citizens. He has to approve it before it can happen to his citizens. He has to allow it. That's a kingdom. Because a kingdom is a different system. It, it's a king, a real king. Because we have a lot of kingdoms that have come up that are not real kingdoms. And then secondly, the... The kingdom culture is determined by the code of code of the king, the constitutional code of the king. The constitutional code of our king is righteousness or righteous or right standing. What it means is that the code of our kingdom is the king has to keep his own word. So the laws of the king, the laws of the kingdom that are in his word, the king has to keep them. In, in a lot of kingdoms we see around, the king creates laws for the citizens, not for himself. So he doesn't keep those laws. So it's not a real kingdom. But in a real kingdom, the king himself keeps his own word and his own laws. That's the kingdom we are in. He is righteous. He has to stand by his word. He has to keep it himself. Not just we keeping it, he has to keep it <laughs> also. That's how powerful our king and our kingdom is. So rulership versus religion is a big thing. And because in our kingdom, we are kings, in our kingdom, he makes us king over things. He owns us and he owns everything. So we as kings are stewards over his belonging, over his house, over his land, over his car, over his food, over his garden, over his flowers, over his animals. Everything is his. His clothes, everything. So when you're in a kingdom... In a real kingdom, you own nothing. The king owns own everything. Your clothes, your teeth, your mouth, your foot, everything. <laughs> your hands. So when you are saying your deed is his, it's his land. So when there's a problem on the land, you're not getting water, you're not getting... So, um, father, your house, lights need to be paid. Um, water, water not running here, father. It's your land. Or oh, the plants, the plants, the, the soil, is problems with the soil. You need to do something about this. What, what are we going to do about this? This is your land. These are your plants. <laughs> These are your animals. This is your clothes. These clothes mashing up, Father. I'm your citizen. I'm looking old. The clothes mashing up. What to do? The car breaking down. This is your car. All is yours, Father. None is, none is mine. I cool. This is your car. 
I drive in your car and your car is mashing up, it's old, it's been problems, you have to see about that because that's your car, right? What do you want me to do about this, which is your car? I'm steward, I'm here, ready? Ready to act, ready to do what you want me to do? Just tell me what to do to take care of your car. I'm washing it, doing what I'm supposed to do, but there's money need to be paid to fix it. Or is it that I took the wrong car? Is it that I have the wrong car? Do you want me to sell it? Do you want me to get rid of it? Because it's your car. What do you want me to do with it? <laughs> In other words, you move the stress off of yourself. Religion is taking the stress on and trying to fight up with everything. No, 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 no. In a kingdom, you're a king. And you're a king under the king of kings. And as a king, he makes you rule over things. He gives you rulership over things. And because you're under his rulership, ruling over things, you can access and address him how to rule this, how to dominate this, how to take charge of this, what to do about this. And you go and you rule it as if he's doing it. That's how you do it. Because in a kingdom, it's a different level of living. Right? Peace is normal in real kingdom, especially in the kingdom that we are from, which is heaven. You see, this kingdom doesn't want to... The aim of this kingdom also is not to try to take people to heaven. That's not the aim. The aim is trying to get people, heaven to earth, to change the systems of the earth, that's another big one, into the kingdom of heaven. That is why when Jesus said, go into all the world and teach, the challenge is the word there is not necessarily teach. The reading of the word is really transformed. It the kid is, is like a convincing, is influencing people of the principles the king wants us to influence them by. And that's the challenge. We think teaching and preaching just means standing up and talking, telling somebody something on a, on a pulpit or in a, in a group or whatever it is. No, 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 no. We, we, and it's because of the language. That's the challenge. When I was talking about language, the intention is convincing the intention is about influencing, persuading. That's what it really means, right? The original language, the original intention really there, right? And then showing them the way how he lives. So we are supposed to demonstrate Jesus. So when, let me give you a vivid example. When people are sick, you know, sometimes they will say, hey, don't come around me, I have the flu. But think about this. When people are sick, around Jesus, do they say, Jesus, don't come around me because I have the flu, or I have, I have, this, I have this sickness, don't, don't come, you'll get it. What do they do? They run to Jesus. Why? Why do they run to him? But they try to stay away from us when they're sick. Why? Because we're supposed to teach them everything he has commanded us. And command us doesn't mean what he said, but also his life. He was able to live free from sickness and deaths and all those other things. So, okay, why am I getting sick if I'm a citizen of the kingdom? I need to check and see what's going on here, Father. What's happening here? I'm a citizen of your kingdom. I'm your son. Why is this sickness still in my body? This body is yours. This can't be here, but that's one stage. The next stage is when somebody is sick and you go to them, um, you say, hey, do come because I have sickness. Say, no, 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 I came to bring some health. Our goal is supposed to be, I came to bring some health. It's like when Jesus met the man in the, at the pool, side of the pool. He asked the man, do you want to get well? In other words, Jesus didn't stay away from the man. Jesus went and said, do you want to get well? He went to bring health to the man. That is what we are supposed to do in teaching Jesus, in teaching what Jesus has commanded us. He went to the person who was sick. So when somebody is sick, our goal is, okay, we, the, Mark says it, we go and we, what? we place our hands on the sick. That verse didn't talk about pastors alone placing their hands. Anyone who believes these are the signs shall follow them. And one of the signs is we shall place our hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's a sign of those who believe, of believers in Jesus Christ. As citizens of his kingdom, as ambassadors who represent Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul says that we are ambassadors. You know what ambassadors is? Ambassadors represent the nation, you know. And the, in this kingdom, the nation is the king. So ambassador of Christ, of the king, Christ, right? So the word Christ really means anointed king. It doesn't mean um, Christ, the savior. 
That's what we get mixed up. The word Christ doesn't mean savior. The word Christ means anointed king. The king of kings. That's what it means. It was the word, it was the word reserved for the one who would be king of kings. Who will now, that king is the one who will now do something to salvage humanity. But he not just is a savior. He first is king. So we are ambassadors of this king. So whatever this king does, we do. We go and we represent what this king does by doing what he did. <laughs> That's what kings does. As a matter of fact, when an American ambassador shows up in your country, he can't share something or, or some other perspective that doesn't represent the nation of the U.S. You know. He has to share, share exactly what the administration or the leadership of the U.S. thinks and wants <laughs> and, and functions as. If he cannot do it, he's fired. He can, he, he's fired one time. That's what the ambassador does. An ambassador represents the king or the leader or the nation they're from. So as, as ambassadors of Christ, how do we do this? How do we, how do we move from religious to rulership? How do we move from just language to the intent of, of our Father? How do we move from, from physical focus to spiritual focus and then influence the physical with the spiritual? So the spiritual shows up in the physical. How do we do that? How do we move from slavery mentality and operation to sonship? Right? How do we do that? How do we move from just focusing on anniversaries of birth and, and, and wedding and so forth to anniversary of purpose and, and, and achieving and fulfilling the will of God and the vision of God and the mission of God and, and the goals that he has set? How do we move from that to this? That's what I would like to share with you all. Those operations, those things, and the number one secret is the mentality. The link between what we are doing or where, what the, how we have been groomed and cultured to how the kingdom operates is the mentality. How do we transform the mentality? The full mentality, not just them. There are different parts there that we will talk about. To develop, to be able to say, okay, yes, we know all of this in the word. We know what it is. We're hearing it from our pastors, from our leaders, from reading the word. How do I get it to show up in the physical reality? Because the spiritual is the reality. This physical is a reflection of the physical, of the spiritual reality. But we have to come to that. We have to, we have to develop a mentality to be able to accept that um, and be able to function in that. All right? <clears throat> and that's, that's the kind of work we will do. And the greatest teacher, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, he can help us transform our mentality more than any ritual, any kind of simi-dimi thing that all these Eastern mysticism and all these people dealing with and all these motivational speakers. He's the greatest teacher in the universe. Not just in Trinidad and Tobago, not just in Grenada, not just in Barbados, not just in America. In the universe, not just on the earth, you know. In the universe, <laughs> in the greatest teacher. So, join me. Um, if you like this and there are things you want me to share with it, now I'm going to share, of course, the principles. Principles, how to apply the principles of the kingdom. And there are several principles. There are about 26 to 30 principles. And there, there are some main ones and there are some um, um, minor ones. Principles, it's like principles like gravity is a principles of physical reality, physical reality, right? But in the kingdom of principles that we have to operate at. And those principles, as we apply them in our minds and in our being, they, they actually produce results, right? In our business, in our work, in our, in our lives, in our relationships, all over, in the community that we're dealing with, in the nation, right? It produces the results. Heaven on earth, where people are free to walk the streets, peacefully, where everything you touch turn to multiply. Was, wow! That's the idea. Where your marriage is like a marriage made in heaven, with all the differences and the disagreements <laughs> that you have, right? Where is like a marriage made in heaven, right? That's the kind of lifestyle the kingdom brings, all right? Where your effect transform things, transform communities, transform where it attracts people. People want to run you down for help, right? 
That's the kind of kingdom. Just as they run on Jesus. That's the kingdom. All right? So if you, there's anything about this you like and you want to get more of it, let me know. And I hope this really helps. But I want to share more of, about it and go through each part in detail. How are we going to apply this, these things that we're hearing and seeing in our reality? All right? That we're experiencing, right, guys? So thank you, um, community group. Um, let's pray about this and, and continue to work on it. All right? Um, Jesus is Lord, owner, right? That's a principle. <laughs> let's work on it. All right? Have fun. Bye-bye. Bless you. Mm-mm. <clears throat>